So <clears throat> when we sat down to think about this, we said, well, first, we certainly want workers' councils. We don't want a system in which people go to work as employees for an employer who has the right to decide what they produce and how they go about it. Um, that's not self-management. Self-management is I get to decide what I'm making and I get to decide how I go about it. Now, if I'm not working as an individual, if I'm working with a hundred other people, that means we, the hundred of us, have the right to decide what we're making and how we go about it. Um, and traditionally, this is, I mean, this is something that has been around for a long time. And in one way or another, the notion has been, well, workers' councils that are what you might call sovereign over workplace decisions, um, this is a desirable alternative to having capitalist employers or communist commissars telling workers what it is that they have to do. Um, so we said we certainly want workers' councils. Um, we also said, we, we also said I, I think we want consu neighborhood consumption councils where people can make their consumption desires known, um, both individual consumption desires and desires about what sort of neighborhood public goods they want. Um, should we have a new park? Should we have new swing sets in the park? Should we improve the sidewalks? Um, do we need a new clinic in our neighborhood? That kind of thing. So let's have neighborhood councils where the people who live in neighborhoods will make those decisions. Um, so that was the first step. We want to have councils. We want to have neighborhood consumer councils. We want to have worker councils. Um, <clears throat> the second was, well, what's the principle that we want to establish um, for how people are remunerated, how people are paid? Um, <clears throat> we said, well, the principle is really the value that pay or remuneration should be in accord or in accordance with effort. Any differences in effort? Well, then the question is, <clears throat> who's going to judge that? And we said, well, for better or for worse, um, it really the best, that for better or for worse, it really is coworkers that are in the best position to sort of make judgments about whether some people are just working harder and making more sacrifices than others. Will it be perfect? My own opinion is, no, it's not going to be perfect. Um, on the other hand, <clears throat> but in any case, that was our next institution, that within workers' councils, and our proposal has been that this should be up to individual worker councils, that what they, what, what they each need to do is actually make some judgments about whether there are differences in sacrifices and efforts. And they need to set up whatever procedure that they feel is the best way to go about that. They can make it very elaborate. They can make it very simple. Um, but that's up to them individually. But the goal is that, they're, that and we call them effort rating committees, um, that councils would have effort rating committees. They would be responsible for telling the rest of the world, whether there were any differences in effort, because the second principle is that it's differences in effort that give you differences in consumption rights. Um, we also <coughs> recommended that if you wanted to achieve self-management, if you wanted people to have truly, effectively equal opportunities um, to participate in decision-making to the extent that they were affected by them, that you would need to reorganize the work process in a way that we call balancing jobs. In, in any workplace, there are some tasks that empower the people who carry them out to basically have more information, knowledge about what it is that the workplace options are. <clears throat> So the example we always discussed was, well, if you have some people sweeping floors as their entire job, and they do that all day, week in and week out, and then there's other people whose job is, I go to this meeting at 9 o'clock, and then at 10.30 I go to another meeting, and this is a meeting about, let's think about whether we can, you know, let's think and talk about whether we should change our product. 
let's think and talk about whether or not we should reorganize the, you know, the work so that we do it at a different time or in a different way. If some people are going to those kinds of meetings all day and other people are just sweeping the floor, well, you can have a workers' council where they each have one vote ultimately in decision-making, but it's sort of, it's a sham to pretend that they are, that they effectively, you know, have, they, that they both have self-management. They both have an, a chance to influence what the choices that will be made in their workplace are. So we said it's, it's probably very important to reorganize jobs so that they are balanced to the greatest extent possible for empowerment. And why shouldn't they be balanced for desirability? There are some things that are unpleasant. There are some things that are more pleasant. So we recommended that workplaces should have some sort of process, again, that's at their discretion how they go about it, it's at their discretion just, you know, how elaborate it is, but that there should be an, there, there should be an institutional embodiment of the, of the need to organize work in a way that you don't have some people doing all the empowering tasks and some people doing tasks that really do not empower them to, to effectively take part in decisions. Um, now, at some point, the question becomes, fine, so you don't have private enterprise, um, instead, you have self-managed workers' councils. Um, you have consumer councils um, instead of every individual goes out and buys in the marketplace, you know, with whatever their income has to be. Um, <clears throat> but in any modern economy, um, there's a tremendous division of labor. Lots of what every workplace needs are things that are produced by other workplaces. And, of course, everything that the consumers need in their neighborhood is coming from workplaces. Well, how do you coordinate all that? And here the, the, the standard, there, there was a different, there was actually a second Tina besides the famous one from Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s. When she said Tina, what she was saying is there is no alternative to neoliberal capitalism. Not only is communism not an alternative, but they're really, what, what now we might call social democratic capitalism is dead. She was sort of <clears throat> pronouncing them dead in the past. So she was saying the kinds of economic reforms, neoliberal economic reforms that she was bringing to the UK, um, just as Ronald Reagan was doing exactly at the same time in the United States, that this is the future, there is no alternative. That's what she meant by Tina. There was a very famous British political economist named Alec Nove who wrote a book and published in 1983 called The Economics of Feasible Socialism. And he was not talking to the Margaret Thatchers. He was talking to everybody that didn't like neoliberal capitalism. And he was telling that audience, there is no alternative between a market system and a system of planning that whether you, believe, whether you want it to be or not, it's inevitably going to be authoritarian. So his Tina to those who were disenamored of Margaret Thatcher-style neoliberal capitalism, his Tina was, look, <clears throat> for a long time, anti-capitalists, have believed that there's something called democratic planning that's not authoritarian planning, and it's not markets. But that is a myth. That is wrong. That's actually not true. And it's time for us to grow up and realize that. And he posed this very, very clearly in the preface to his book, saying, I am addressing an audience out there all of you well-meaning people who reject capitalism and reject communism, you need to get over the illusion that your system that you want isn't going to either be a market system or it's going to be authoritarian planning. Now, he was somebody who favored what's now called market socialism. And so he was telling us that there's no way to coordinate. You can have all these workers' councils, and they can be very self-managed by the workers themselves. You can have all these wonderful democratic neighborhoods you know, that are managing their own selves. But in a modern economy, there's no way to coordinate all of those interrelated activities except through markets or a system that will inevitably be a system that's authoritarian type of command planning. 
And that was a Tina that we also were very self-consciously taking on. Just because somebody who's a famous economist tells you that doesn't mean it's true. And we also, in our own background, believed going way back in time to 1900 wasn't the vision of the early socialists always one where there would be a kind of participatory democratic planning that went on between the self-managing workers in one factory and the self-managing. Wasn't that the vision? And now he's telling us, get over that. That was an illusion. You were in, in, in la-la land, and you're never going to get any place as long as you're holding on to that. So I think, we, I think Michael and I both recognize, well, that was our belief that that's a possible desirable alternative. And now we have somebody telling us to grow up that it's an impossibility, but let's just be sure that they're right before we accept this limitation on our thinking process. So, and we discovered he's wrong. And the discovery that he's wrong was part of discovering that, and this is the sort of last fundamental institution that's a defining feature of this model or vision called a participatory economy. We designed a planning procedure in which self-managed workers' councils and self-managed neighborhood consumption councils could plan themselves their interrelated activities. That, and we said we will we will we'll, we'll define we, we will describe a set of procedures that they can go through in order to come up with a plan that coordinates their activities. Um, and we will look and see whether this procedure <coughs> will actually achieve an outcome that's a feasible plan. Will they come to a conclusion and discover that we now have worked things out? And if we go ahead and now just sit, if we now go back and do what we all just agreed to, it'll actually be possible. We can actually do this. Um, will it be fair? Will they have planned something that, it, that turns out to be fair? Will they have planned something that uses what we view as the scarce resources that belong to everybody and should benefit everybody more or less equally according to their efforts? Will they have come up with a plan um, you know, that is efficient in, in a very traditional economic kind of sense? Um, so we defined a procedure, a set of rules that people could go through. Um, we sort of modeled it the way theoretical economists do. Um, and we demonstrated that if these councils participate in this way, then yes, you would get a feasible plan that's perfectly, a, a, it's a plan that can be carried out, and in fact, there's every reason to believe it would be far more efficient than the kind of results you get from either capitalist markets or, for, or from, from the sort of totalitarian and central planning. Then when you take a look... I mean, one of the big problems with central planning is if the central planners are making up the plan, where do they get all the information? Where do they get accurate information about what capabilities and desires are? Um, well, that's sort of a famous problem of central planning. Well, does this procedure essentially take advantage of knowledge that only can reside in amongst workers in a workplace about what they can do? Or, and, and so we just... We discovered that it has very information, um, you know, positive elements to it. Um, and we discovered that, in fact, there's every reason to believe that the plan that they would come to would be far more efficient than the kind of results that you get in a... And what, what the, 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 the basic process is, worker councils are unique in our planning environment, in our, in our planning proposal, what is unique about it is that every worker council is, it has complete power over making its own proposals about what it wants to do. And it also has complete authority over revising those proposals. What's also unique about the proposal is somebody, in it, somebody eventually in any planning process has to say that proposal is unacceptable. That proposal is unacceptable because it's unfair. That proposal is unacceptable because it's inefficient. Somebody has to say no to proposals that are actually socially irresponsible. 
our planning procedure and in, in all other planning procedures, there's always some sort of authority. There's some sort of planning authority that is presumed to have information that would allow them to see when something is socially irresponsible. So they get the power to say no. And our proposal is that there is no central planning authority that has the power to say no. In fact, the councils say no and yes to one another. And in order to be able to do that, you have to provide the councils, both the worker councils and the, and the consumer councils, you have to provide them with readily available, convenient information so that they can judge whether somebody else's proposal about what they want to do, what they want to produce, what resources they want to use to do it. I have to know, have an easy way to know whether that proposal is socially responsible. And... And if it is, then I can easily say yes, and we don't need a central planning authority to be the no-sayer, the yes-sayer. Um, so the procedure was also designed so that it actually provided that kind of information. So in the end, nobody gets to tell a group of workers, nobody makes a proposal for a group of workers what it is they do or how they go about it. They make their own proposals. Nobody gets to tell them how to revise those proposals. And all of us, basically, every worker council and consumer council is in a position where we make our own proposals and we revise our own proposals, but we are empowered to protect ourselves from socially irresponsible proposals that others might make because we get to vote and say, no, we can see that that's socially irresponsible. Um, that's the essential nature of the planning procedure, and it really bears very little resemblance to any sort of planning procedures that people have ever proposed in the past. Um, so it is qualitatively different from authoritarian planning and qualitatively different from, from a market system. Um, and I, I'd say at, at one level, just achieving that is kind of a, a useful accomplishment. Um, at least it demonstrates quite concretely that you're not limited to um, authoritarian planning and markets when you're thinking about what are our options as human beings for organizing our economic activities. There is a third alternative. Um, now, some people might look at it and decide, well, I don't think it's very attractive. <laughs> um, but then that's at least a step that we can make. We can look and see, well, what, are, what would be the advantages and perhaps disadvantages of doing things that way? But at least there's another alternative that we can talk about. And interestingly enough, when you stand back from that planning procedure and ask, isn't this the kind of thing that the early socialists back before there was ever a Soviet Union were sort of thinking and dreaming of as what they had in mind when they said we, this ugly Dickinsonian capitalism is just tearing us apart. I think that this, I think this planning procedure is it actually is consistent with what early socialists always imagined was the alternative that they were for. And, and, and that's in some sense comforting in my mind that the thing we came up with that we clearly know is now possible um, is actually very consistent with the kind of thing that early socialists always wanted. Because I think when, I mean, one of the things that we discovered is, you know, that we discovered was when the Soviet Union came up with central planning, I think if you went back and showed that to William Morris, sort of an early, late 19th century you know, British socialist, he would have looked at that and said, that wasn't what I was thinking of. I wasn't thinking of, what have you done? Um, and in fact, a lot of libertarian socialists did say just that when the Soviet Union set up its planning procedure. Early socialists weren't upset when they when they nationalized the means of production, when they dispossessed the capitalist. But early socialists were very, very upset. Many were very, very upset when, wait a minute, what happened to the self-managing workers' councils? What happened to the factory committees? And now they have no power. You've disempowered them. You have a system that's, you know, a bureaucratic system of central planning by bureaucrats. This this was not what we imagined. So so I think this, this last institution we have, um, workers' councils, consumer councils, remuneration according to 
um, to effort and sacrifice, balancing jobs for empowerment in the workplace, and this participatory planning procedure, I think it is a lot more consistent with what early socialists always thought that's what we want.